Okay. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. أعوذ بالله السميع من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والعذوان إلا على الظالمين والعاقبة للمتقين اللهم صل وسلم وبارك على عبدك ورسولك محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا um, We're actually getting towards the, la- the last part of Kitab al-Iman We've been studying the book of faith for a very long time now um, Alhamdulillah, it, it's been, uh, hopefully those who have been taking notes will be able to review their notes. I actually encourage you guys to frequently review your notes, inshallah, to make these connections. If you remember, when we started off Kitab al-Iman, the Book of Faith, one of the first ahadith we covered was the Prophet wasallam saying that Iman is 60 or 70 branches of faith. So al-Bukhari, rahimahullah, as he's proving these different uh, aspects of faith. He's using the ahadith of the Prophet ﷺ to teach us what iman is, how iman increases, how it decreases, what parts of iman are encompassed in the tongue, what parts of iman are encompassed in action, what parts remain in the heart, um, what will iman do for us in this dunya, what will iman do for us in the akhirah and the hereafter. Al-Bukhari rahimahullah ta'ala has also covered a lot of branches of faith. So the branch of faith that he's covering, and this is again uh, the way that he structures his book, um, the last branch of faith that we're going to cover is this one, and he chose it to be the janaza, obviously because it's the last, the last thing that you do in this, that, that that will be of your dunya, your last state as you're being carried to your grave. So he chose that to be the last branch of faith that he would cover. Now the Prophet ﷺ, when he said that there are numerous branches of faith, he said, "Alaha la ilaha illallah." Um, that the highest branch of faith is la ilaha illallah, and the lowest is. To, adha, tariq, to remove something harmful from the road. So this isn't that this is the lowest branch of faith, but this is the way Al-Bukhari rahimahullah ta'ala does his structuring of his books, that he chose this to be the last branch of Iman, the last short uh, of Iman that he would um, mention. So this hadith, um, I'm going to read the Sanad because the Sanad has something beautiful in it. Haddathana Ahmad ibn Abdullah ibn Ali al-Manjufi qala haddathana rawh قال حدثنا عوف عن الحسن ومحمد عن أبي هريرة. Now the reason why عن الحسن ومحمد. Um, if you guys remember, sometimes Al Bukhari رحمه الله تعالى doesn't mention the entire name because it's a given in hadith literature. So for example, if he says Abdullah, who does Abdullah refer to? Abdullah bin Mas'ud رضي الله عنه. For example, here he says Al Hasan ومحمد. There are a lot of Hasans and there are a lot of Muhammads. All right, but he said Al Hasan wa Muhammad. Al Hasan and Muhammad narrate this hadith. Who do you guys think Al Hasan is, and who do you think Muhammad is? Al Hasan, Al Hasan ibn Ali, or Al Hasan al Basri. This is Al Hasan al Basri, Sayyid al the great, the greatest scholar of the of the generation after the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, Al Imam Hasan al Basri, rahimahullah taala. So if, the, if Al-Hasan is mentioned without any name after it, then it's referring to an Imam Hassan al-Basri rahimahullah ta'ala. Now, uh, also he says Al-Hasan and Muhammad narrate the hadith. Now, which Muhammad do you think it is? That's a tough one. I don't, maybe the Qalam students would get it. <laughs> Who's a famous Muhammad that lived alongside Al-Hasan, was considered a contemporary of Imam Hassan al-Basri? Muhammad ibn Sirin rahimahullah ta'ala, Imam Muhammad ibn Sirin rahimahullah ta'ala. They are contemporaries, they are the two greatest of the tabi'een. So he says Al-Hasan and Muhammad narrate the hadith. And this is beautiful because uh, only one of them is required for the chain, for the sanat, right? For the chain. But he's saying both of them separately narrated the hadith as well. Uh, and of course they narrated it from Abu Hurairah radiallahu ta'ala anhu that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, مَنِ اتَّبَعَ جَنَازَةَ مُسْلِمٍ إِيمَانًا وَاحْتِسَابًا وَكَانَ مَعَهُ حَتَّى يُصَلِّي عَلَيْهَا وَيَفْرُغَ مِنْ دَفْنِهَا فَإِنَّهُ يَرْجِعُ مِنَ الْأَجْرِ بِقِرَاتَيْنِ كُلُّ قِرَاتٍ مِثْلُ أُحُدْ وَمَنْ صَلَّى عَلَيْهَا ثُمَّ رَجَعَ قَبْلَ أَنْ تُدْفَنْ فَإِنَّهُ يَرْجِعُ بِقِرَاتٍ Okay, so the hadith is that the Prophet ﷺ says that a believer who accompanies the janazah of a Muslim out of sincere faith 
and hoping to attain Allah's reward. Iman and wahtisab, and if you realize this is very common in what the Prophet ﷺ, as he presents a good deed, he frequently puts these two conditions. These two conditions, by the way, are present in any good deed that we do. But the Prophet ﷺ mentions them specifically when he talks about certain actions. So, من, من صام رمضان إيمانا واحتسابا غفر له ما تقدم من ذنب whoever fasts Ramadan out of faith and seeking the reward from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So faith refers to the sincerity and steadfastness and seeking the reward from Allah, a sense of accountability, making sure that you're doing the action right. Because if you're trying to seek the reward from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then you're not, just, you're not going to just get by with the deed. You'll actually apply yourself to try to do it as proper as possible. So these two conditions are present in any good deed, but the Prophet ﷺ frequently mentions them uh, when he talks about uh, you know, specific acts. Usually, some of the scholars of hadith, they pointed out that the Prophet ﷺ mentions these two things when he's about to mention an amazing reward. Why? Because he doesn't want you to think that you're going to get that amazing reward with, by being lazy. Right? He wants to stress to you as he's about to inform you of an amazing reward. And it's actually consistent that when the Prophet ﷺ specifies iman and wahtisaba out of you know, uh, faith, meaning sincerity, and hoping to attain the reward, it is a hadith that's going to have an amazing reward mentioned, specified from the Prophet ﷺ as well. So whoever accompanies the funeral procession of a Muslim out of sincere faith and hoping to attain Allah's reward and remains with it, meaning remains with the janazah, until the funeral prayer is offered and until the burial is finished, then he will return home with a reward of two qirats. I'm not going to define what qirat is yet. Two qirats. So qirat is a unit. Okay, so he'll have two qirats. Then the Prophet said in the hadith, he's asked, what is a qirat, Ya Rasulullah? The Prophet says, a qirat is a mountain the size of Uhud. A mountain the size of Uhud. So two, two qirats, two mountains of good deeds, each of them the size of Uhud. The Prophet says, if a person prays the janazah and he follows until the, until the dafn, until the burial he has, two qirats. Now if he offers the janazah and he returns before the burial, the Prophet ﷺ says, فَلَهُ قِرَاتِ Then he will have one, uh, one mountain of good deeds as reward. Now the, the chapter of this is Bab Tiba'ul Janaz Min Al Iman. So it, it's the chapter of following the janazah is a form of faith because Al Bukhari rahimullah is mentioning branches of faith. So it's a very simple and straightforward chapter. But as we said, Ibn Hajar rahimullah sa- says that Al Bukhari mentioned this as the last the last branch of faith in the book of faith because this is the last state of your dunya. And he also said something beautiful. He said, the time you will need your iman most is when you go to your grave. That's the time that you will really, really need it. So it's the last state of your dunya and it's the time where your iman will be most precious to you. He also says, Rahimahullah Ta'ala, uh, it, uh, ittiba'a, uh, following here, does not mean, as some people misunderstood it, to literally walk behind the janazah, to literally walk behind the body. Uh, that's actually in some cultures, it's, it's like, you know, if you, if you walk ahead of the body, you'll be stopped and told to walk behind it. He said that it's not talking about a technical walking behind the janazah, but rather accompanying the janazah. And he, the proof of that, he mentions Ibn Umar radiallahu anhu walking in front of the janazah, which is narrated authentically by Ibn Hibban rahimahullah ta'ala and others. So the point here is that you walk with the janazah, not necessarily behind it, but with the janazah. There's no basis to uh, this concept of following it in the literal sense. Okay. Uh, he also says, if you realize here, the Prophet ﷺ says, ma'ahu, but then he says, alayha. Okay. Which is really powerful because the Prophet ﷺ says, you follow him to the janazah until you pray on it. Okay. There is a subtlety there that's very powerful. You follow him to the janazah or follow her to the janazah and then you pray on it until it is prayed upon. Have you ever realized that when a person dies, they lose their identity? When, you're in your, when, when your body has been brought to the masjid or to the place of the janazah, um, do they say, okay, bring Umar over here? What do they say? Bring the body. Right? So you, subhanAllah, you immediately lose your identity in the worldly sense, even as your, your janazah has not yet been prayed. Bring the body over here, bring the body over there. So you follow him, you follow her until the time of the prayer, 
you bring it, you pray upon it. Suddenly, it's not a person anymore. Suddenly, it's it's a body. Okay, suddenly that, that person has actually lost their identity. Uh, Ibn Hajar rahimahullah ta'ala also says, Hatta yusalli alayha, until you have prayed on it, or until it has been prayed upon. Um, he mentions here, and this is another technical fact, I'm just kind of getting the technical things out of the way. He said that if a person stayed with the janazah the entire time, but they had a, there was, there was a manner, there was a hindrance to you actually praying on the janazah. Okay, so, you know, for whatever reason, you were in a state of janaba, um, you know, you, you, you were in a state of impurity, you weren't able to pray on it. He says that you would actually have the full reward if you accompany the janazah, because the Prophet ﷺ is mentioning ittiba' al-janazah, following the janazah, being with the janazah, even if you did not pray because of something forbidding you from praying, okay, some, some technicality forbidding you from praying, you would still have the reward if you followed the janazah and accompanied the janazah all the way through. Now there's some other hadith that mention this idea of following the janazah. There's the hadith of al-Bara radiallahu ta'ala anhu, who says, uh, this is also a hadith in Bukhari, قال, um, أمرنا النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم بسبع, that the Prophet صلى الله عليه commanded us to do seven things. Okay? ونهانا عن سبع, and he forbade us from seven things. I'll just mention the ones that he commanded us to do. He said, أمرنا باتباع الجنائز, he commanded us to follow the janaiz, وعيادة المريض, and to visit the sick. The, 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 the sick. وإجابة الداعي, and to answer the invitation of the one who, in, who invites us. وَنَصْرِ المظلوم, And to support the one who is being oppressed. وَإِبْرَارِ الْقَسْمِ Which is to fulfill the oaths. وَرَدِّ salam To return salam to someone. وَتَشْمِيتِ الْعَاطِسِ And to say, يَرْحَمُكَ اللَّهِ When someone sneezes. To, to, wish, uh, uh, to, to, to wish Allah's mercy on a person who sneezes. So the seven things again that the Prophet ﷺ commanded. Anyone remember? Or who wrote them down quick enough? I like how you keep going to Zubair, Zubair, apparently you know everything. <laughs> Zaid, what are the seven things I just mentioned? Uh, when someone says, the sneeze that you have to say, uh, yeah. yeah. Uh-huh. Totally out of order, but okay. <laughs> yeah. He's, he's got the other five, he's giving you the wrong answers. <laughs> okay, seven things. The first one, ittiba' al janais, following the funeral procession. Second one, iyadat al maril visiting a sick person. Third one, ijabat al-da'i, answering the invitation of the one who invites you. Fourthly, nasr al supporting the one who is oppressed. Fifth one, ibrar al-qasam, to fulfill your oaths. Sixth one, radda salam to return salam. If someone says salamu alaykum to you, you have to say wa alaykum as-salam. Seventh, with tashmeet al atas it is mandatory if someone sneezes that, and they say alhamdulillah, that you say yarhamukallah. If someone sneezes and says alhamdulillah, you are obligated to say yarhamukallah. May Allah have mercy on you. Otherwise, you are mocked by the shaytan, as the Prophet ﷺ said. Another hadith, um, which is also in al Bukhari, uh, from Abu Hurairah radiallahu ta'ala anhu qal, uh, قال سمعت رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم يقول I heard the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم say حق المسلم على المسلم خمس The Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم said A Muslim has five rights upon you Every Muslim has five rights upon you The first one رد السلام Okay To, res- to say salam Alright To respond to salam If someone says salam to you You have to say وعليكم السلام Okay The second one عيادة المريض To visit him when he's sick now realize the Raddu Salam is in normal circumstances, right? So when everyone's healthy, someone says salam, wa alaikum salam. Then when that person becomes sick, you go and you visit that person. Thirdly, once they pass away, ijab ittiba' al janaz to follow their janazah, to follow their funeral procession. Then he says, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, wa ijaba tu da'wa wa tashmeetu al-atas, the Prophet ﷺ says to, to, uh, to answer the invitation of a person when they invite you and to say rahamukallah, to wish Allah's mercy upon, upon them uh, when they sneeze. So these are actually the rights of a believer upon you. The Prophet ﷺ mentioned them as five in one hadith. In another hadith, we were commanded to do seven. Al-Bara radiallahu anhu says we were commanded to do seven things. Okay, now just a little bit on the history of Salat al-Janazah. Okay, because Janazah is a very interesting institution in Islam. We don't have the exact date when Janazah was legislated. When did the Muslims start praying the funeral prayer on somebody? 
All right. Now, obviously, there was this concept of once a person passes away, you ask Allah's forgiveness for them, you pray for them. But when was the janazah actually legislated? So we know that it wasn't legislated when Khadija radiallahu anha passed away. Because it's mentioned as, it's, it's very painful that the Prophet sallallahu when he buried Khadija radiallahu anha, he buried her and she was not, she did not live to see the time of the legislation of Salat al-Janazah. Khadija radiallahu anha passed away 10 years after the beginning of the revelation. So she passed away 10 years after al-Bi'tha when the Prophet sallallahu uh, was 50 years old. It was, now the first janaza that is narrated is the janaza of al-Bara ibn Ma'roor. Al-Bara ibn Ma'roor. And he's an interesting character, radiallahu anhu. Al-Bara ibn Ma'roor was the first person to take the pledge with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam in the first bay'atul aqaba, the first pledge of aqaba. But he did not live to see the hijrah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. He died a month before the hijrah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam, the actual migration. So he came, he was the first one to initiate the pledge with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. But by the time the Prophet ﷺ made his way over to Medina, uh, Al-Bara radiallahu ta'ala anhu passed away. When the Prophet ﷺ came to Medina, the Prophet ﷺ prayed on him. So there's salah on him. Then the first companion to die in Medina, As'ad ibn Zurara, the Prophet ﷺ also prayed on him. And then Uthman ibn Mab'un, the Prophet ﷺ prayed on him. So Janazah was an institution sometime between the death of Khadija and the death of Al-Bara. Most likely the first year uh, of, Hij- uh, of Hijrah when the Prophet Sallallahu made his way to Medina because we don't have any narrations of Janazah in Mecca. So it's, it, it came in that time. Now, as far as visiting the graves is concerned, to give you some context, the Prophet Sallallahu forbade people from visiting the graves. So it was considered haram through 20 years of the Prophet Sallallahu you know, calling for people to go visit the graveyards, men and women. What that meant was the only time you went to the graveyard was when? When you were burying somebody. That was it. Okay? So you, you only went to the graveyard when you were going to bury somebody. Otherwise, it was considered haram, not makru, not hated. It was considered absolutely prohibited to visit the graveyards. Why? Why do you guys think that is? Shirk. Shirk? Is it shirk to visit the graveyards? The fear of taking people. But wasn't that going to happen anyway? Right? Ghosts. Ghosts? Oh, okay. <laughs> All right. The crying and the wailing. Don't people still cry and wail? Taking it as a place of worship. But don't people, don't we have people that still do that today? So, what's the issue here? Anybody? So the Prophet ﷺ wanted Tawheed, wanted the concept of monotheism to be settled in the hearts of the companions so that when they went to the graveyards, once again, there would be absolutely no corruption of that monotheism. There is no way that you can stop ignorant people coming later on in life and building upon the graves and doing certain things at the graveyard and so on and so forth. But the Sahaba had to understand, the Sahaba had to get to a point where Monotheism had settled in their hearts to a point where there was no fear on them worshipping the people in the graves or doing any practices that would be objectionable. At that point, you can imagine 20 years of the call of the Prophet ﷺ. At that point, they understood the foundations of Tawheed. They knew who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was. All of the all of the shirkiyat, all of the associations with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had really been wiped out by that point. So even if the Prophet ﷺ did not give them a single instruction, when they went to the graveyard, they weren't going to make du'a to the people that are dead. They weren't going to build upon the graves because Tawheed had already settled in their hearts. So the Prophet ﷺ kept people away from the graveyard while the religion was still being formulated, while the religion was still taking roots in people's hearts. Realize the Prophet ﷺ had a very serious fear of people building upon the graves and people doing certain things with the graves, which is why when the Prophet ﷺ was passing away, he said, Bury me in my room. وَالنَّصَارَى May Allah curse the Jews and the Christians that took the graves of their prophets as tombs. So the Prophet ﷺ said, Keep me away from the public. Don't put my body out there. And subhanAllah, look at the... This is actually one of the proofs of his prophethood. If the Prophet ﷺ wanted to, he would have said, 
you know, bury me in this place, make a huge tomb and so on and so forth so that people will come and visit and all that type of stuff. The Prophet son himself wished that his grave be in his room. SubhanAllah, he was buried in the same place where he used to pray his Qiyam, where he used to pray his night prayers, where he used to sleep and so on and so forth. In that same room, the Prophet son was buried and nothing was built on the grave of the Prophet son. There is nothing on top of the grave. I know if you Google, if you do a Google image thing on search of the Prophet Sallallahu grave, you're going to get all of these different tombs. Most of them are Ottoman tombs or things from, they have absolutely nothing to do with the Prophet Sallallahu grave. There is no tomb on the grave of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He was buried underground and there was nothing that was built on top of his grave. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam wanted people to have an understanding of the religion before that door was opened. Now, why did he open that door in the first place? Why did he... Seven years after Hijra, approximately seven years after Hijra, why did he open the doors for people to visit? Yes? To remind them of death. He says, Inni nahaytukum an ziyarat al qubur. I used to forbid you. I used to forbid you from visiting the graves. He said, But now visit them. Why? Because it reminds you of death. To the kirukum bil maut. It will remind you of death. It's good for you to go and to remember death. So it became a sunnah after it was haram to visit the graves without the purpose of a janazah. You guys understand? It's sunnah to go to the graveyard and to reflect, okay? Without janazah being there. And the Prophet Sallallahu used to frequently visit Al-Baqir and the companions used to visit the graveyard and so on and so forth. And the Prophet Sallallahu of course, uh, the last trip he made outside of his house was to Al-Baqir, was to visit uh, the people that had passed away in Medina in Al-Baqir. So it became a sunnah at that point to go and reflect. And each one has its own flavor, right? I mean, going to the graveyard, when it's quiet, when there's no janazah going on, and you can sit there and you can reflect, and you can look around, it has its own form of tadabbur and tafakkur, its own invitation to contemplate, and to really take the moment to reflect on the fact that this will one day be you. Whereas a janazah, seeing a person being brought, you know, the grave being opened, them being placed in the dirt, the people throwing the dirt on top of them, the family members crying, and so on and so forth, that has its effect as well. That reminds you of death in a different way. It engages your iman, in a different way. So both of these things, after the death of the Prophet ﷺ, at that point, became sunnah. Okay, and this is why Allah Subhanahu wa Taala even told the Prophet ﷺ, "Inna kamayyit wa inna hum and that you are going to die, you are bound for death, and they are also bound for death. So even the, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala reminded the Prophet ﷺ that you will die like them, you will die like them. So the purpose is when you go to the graveyard, when you see people being buried, is to remind you. It's not for them as much as it is for you. Their, their book is closed with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Their book is closed with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's really for the purpose of those that are burying that person to really take the moments and to reflect and so on and so forth. Uh, the ulama also mentioned that Surah Al-Qiyamah, which I recited, is a visual. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Surah Al-Qiyamah was an early surah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was actually portraying the steps before death. كَلَّا إِذَا بَلَغَتِ التَّرَاقِيَ وَقِيلَ مَنْ رَاقِ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions that you're about to die and you scream for help. Who's going to help me? Somebody help me. And then you realize after screaming for help that this is it. You realize this time is different. This time is different. This time is actually the end. Okay? Then suddenly, subhanAllah, imagine you're watching a movie and they're showing the death of somebody and so on and so forth. Suddenly, وَالْتَفَّتِ السَّاقُ بِالسَّاقُ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says the legs are bound to each other. You know, when a person is, is dead and they're, they're, they're wrapped up and so on and so forth, the legs are crossed and bound to each other. إِلَىٰ رَبِّكَ يَوْمَ إِذِنْ masaq, And the only place you're going at that point, you are on your way to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You are returning back to your Lord. إِنَّا لِلَّهِ وَإِنَّا إِلَيْهِ رَاجِعُونَ We belong to Allah and to Allah we return. Okay, so this concept, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala giving us a visual. Shaykh al-Islam bin Taymiyyah rahimahullah ta'ala uh, was noted to, he used to cry. Okay, this is people of Quran next Ramadan, whatever it is. But he was noted to cry at Wal Tafatisak. When the legs are crossed over one another. Why? Because that's something that you see if you've done janazas, if you washed people and so on and so forth, that's something you can actually imagine. And the Murad here, the what, what's what's desired by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioning that as well. إِلَىٰ رَبِّكَ يَوْمِذِ الْمَسَاقِ is that you can't walk anymore, you have no control over your body anymore, your limbs are being bound and so on and so forth. You are at the mercy of those that are carrying you. You are completely at the mercy of those that are carrying you now, on your way back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, returning to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now what happens as the soul 
returns to the body and the soul waits for its janaza. Okay? Now when a person passes away, and this is this is how it works, you will have a good idea of what's going to happen to you as you are dying. Why? Because some people, the angels of Rahmah, the angels of mercy come. In the Ladina Kalu Rabbuna Allahu Thumastakamu, Tatanazaru Alehim al Malaika, Allah Tahafu, Wala Tahzanu, Wa Abishiru Bil Janati Lati Kuntum to Adun. For the believing for the believing soul, when you pass away, the angels are already comforting you as you are leaving your body. They're inviting you to Jannah as you are leaving your body. So there is a sense of raha, there is a sense of ease and comfort. So the Prophet said, the soul comes out of the body, almost in anticipation, an excitement, the way that the last drop of water would leave the jug, okay, would leave the water skin. That last drop of water comes out smoothly, okay, to the kafan of al Jannah, to the shroud of al Jannah, into the hands of the angels, where it is taken up to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, registered in the scrolls al iliyin okay, in the high scrolls, then it is returned to the body where it waits for the janazah, and the Prophet ﷺ said that the janazah should be rushed. Okay, hurry up with the janazah. You should not wait for the janazah, you should not embalm, you should not send the body back to Pakistan or send it back to Palestine. You put the body in the grave. Take it to the grave as soon as possible. Trust me, that person would not be angry with you if you buried them in Texas. They would be angry with you if you embalmed them and you, and you delayed their janazah for days because that's a form of adab, that, that's a form of torture in and of itself to be in that, in that waiting period. So the Prophet says, Asri'u, hurry up with your janazas. Hurry up with those bodies. Al-ard la tuqaddasu ahada. The earth is not going to make anyone pure, whether you're buried in Dallas or you're buried in Medina or Mecca. Okay, at the end of the day, the earth will not make you a pure person. So hurry up and take them to their graves. The ulama say at that point when the person, because this is talking about tiba al janaza, following the janaza, when the person is placed on the shoulders of the people, and that person is being taken to their grave, some of the ulama they said that the ruh is within the jasad, so the soul is still within the body; it's back into the body. Some of the scholars said that the soul circles the body. Like it's, it's surrounding the body. It's around the body. It's connected. But it's not inside at that point. So it's watching the, the, the procession. And this is why the Prophet ﷺ said that some of the bodies would hurry up. They would quickly, right? They would want to quickly be placed into their grave. So they're, they're light. You can feel the lightness and you can almost feel like you're being rushed, subhanAllah, with the body as you're taking it to the grave. Or some of the bodies might be very heavy. Right? You might feel like it's very slow. The believing soul rushes. The believing soul looks forward to that next step because the believing soul knows that which comes after will be better and will be more comforting. Whereas the, you know, a wicked soul is as hesitant as, as can be. The wicked soul does not want to be taken. The Prophet wasallam he said that when the believing soul is taken, when the believing soul is being carried. Now the sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu in the tiba al janaz is actually to carry the body, to put it on the shoulders, right? That people actually get under it and they put it on their shoulders and they carry the body. The Prophet Sallallahu says that when the believing soul is being taken to the grave, the believing soul shouts, Qaddimuni, 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 Qaddimuni. Hurry up and take me, hurry up and take me, hurry up and take me. Advance forward, go, go, go. SubhanAllah, the believing soul is hurrying the janazah up. But the Prophet ﷺ says, and if the soul is wicked, the soul shouts out, Ya waylaha, Ya waylaha, Ayna tadhabuna biha. Ya waylaha, Ya waylaha, Ayna tadhabuna biha. Woe to it, woe to it. Where are you taking it? Where are you taking it? So the wicked soul, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us from being of those people, actually is trying to slow down the janazah. Don't take me to the grave. Where are you taking it? Woe to it. Not yet. Hold on. What are you all doing? Can't you all hear me? So on and so forth. The Prophet ﷺ said the wicked soul continues to shout and obviously no one would hear their cries. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us of being amongst those people. So it's a very, you know, this is a very critical juncture, a very critical point where you're going from the salah to the grave. And the people are carrying the body and the soul is either in anticipation or the soul is in complete fear of that which is to come. 
The Prophet ﷺ then said that as the body is placed within the grave, as the body is placed within the janazah, uh, within the grave, the Prophet ﷺ says that the grave squeezes the person. Everyone will feel a squeeze as they're placed into their grave. Rasulullah said if anyone was to be spared from that squeeze, it would have been who? Sa'ad ibn Mu'adh radiallahu anhu. He said even the one for whom the throne of Allah shook when he passed away, out of farah, out of joy, the throne of Allah shook out of joy that Sa'ad's soul was returning to occupy one of the lamps under the throne, to occupy its rightful place. Even when Sa'ad ibn Mu'adh died, there is a squeeze, there is a hugging. There, it's, it's either very severe or it's very light when a person is initially placed into their grave. Then the Prophet ﷺ says that a person would hear the last footsteps to leave their janazah. You would hear the footsteps walking away from your grave. And the Prophet ﷺ said Allah would cause them to hear all the way until the last footsteps. The janazahs at the time of the Prophet ﷺ, what were they? When a person was being taken to their grave, when a person was being buried, did the people used to make a lot of noise? Did the people used to chant anything? Did the people used to make these speeches at the grave? Did the people used to do eulogies? No, they didn't do any of that. Did the people used to mourn and scream? No. The Prophet ﷺ, when he took the body and he places the body, the hadith in Abu Dawood is very beautiful because it shows you the way that the Sahaba used to observe janazah. The Prophet ﷺ placed the body inside the dirt and the Sahaba were as if they had birds on their heads, meaning they were completely still and silent. They buried the companion. The Prophet ﷺ says, Istaghfiru li akhakum, seek forgiveness for your brother, فَإِنَّهُ الْآنَ يُسْأَلْ Because he's being asked right now. So everyone, take a few moments, make istighfar, seek forgiveness, make dua for that person. So they would quietly make dua, quietly seek forgiveness, quietly reflect. I mean, compare that type of janazah to our janazahs today. Everyone is quietly reflecting, making dua with the person. And Amr ibn As radiallahu ta'ala anhu has authentically narrated, he, he told his kids, he said, when you bury me, then don't leave the graveyard right away. Wait next to my grave for some time until the messengers of my Lord approach me, until the angels come to me. Why? Because again, you hear the last footsteps that would leave as you're placed into the grave. So subhanAllah, he's saying to his kids, when you bury me, wait, wait a little bit, don't leave right away until the rusul, the, the, the malaika, the angels of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala come to me. And that's at that point uh, a person would answer. And, and again, look, you, you can't, a lot of times, I know there are a lot of practices here like people prompting the dead, like when the angels come to you and they ask you, man rabbuk, say Allah. And when they ask you, who's your messenger? Say Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa When they ask you, what's your religion? Say Islam. It doesn't work that way. It's not that easy. Okay? If that was the case, it would, it would be pretty smooth. It doesn't work that way. When those angels come, that person has to be in a certain spiritual state to be able to answer those questions. This is not just knowing the answers in your head. Otherwise, an ex-Muslim would know how to answer those questions. Okay? This is a very, very serious moment at that point. You can't prompt the dead to say, you know, this is what you're going to say just to remind you when you pass away. There is no communication. You're not, you're not able to, to, to change anything at that point. But instead, staying with them, making dua. The sunnah is to bury them and to stay for a period of time after they pass away, asking for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's forgiveness for them. It is between kiraha and tahrim, between being severely disliked and being absolutely prohibited to speak about matters of the dunya. The majority opinion of kiraha, of it being disliked, to speak about matters of the dunya at the janazah. Think about the janazahs you've been to. You've got the family standing on one side, people come, everyone's crying, they say salam, give them a big hug, just a little bit over, people are already talking about their lunch, they're talking about getting back to work. People haven't seen each other for a long time, so what are you up to these days? SubhanAllah, people engage in their conversations about dunya while they're still at the graveyard. Like talk about not getting the point. There's a person being buried in front of them and they're already talking about matters of the dunya. So it's considered extremely disliked, extremely disliked to talk about matters of the dunya at the janazah uh, to some of the scholars in, in the classical books of fiqh, it's even to a point of tahrim, it's even to a point of, uh, of being uh, forbidden. Now what is the reward of going with the janazah? The hadith, the person that has accompanied the janazah, what is the reward? The Prophet ﷺ says, once again, if a person prays, they catch the salah, 
they would have one qirat. That's one mountain the size of Uhud. Now, if any of you have ever seen Uhud, how many of you have seen Uhud? It's huge, isn't it? And it was probably even bigger back then, okay? It's huge. It's not a mountain. It's more like a valley. It's a huge range. I mean, subhanAllah, a huge mountain. The Prophet ﷺ frequently used to do um, amthad with Uhud. So he used to frequently draw analogies to Uhud. Because it was the biggest mountain that was known to them. So the Prophet ﷺ says you would have a mountain. Can you imagine Uhud in good deeds? Can you imagine Uhud in this dunya in dhahab in gold? If you had Uhud in gold? So the Prophet ﷺ mentions Uhud in ajr. Uhud in good deeds on the Day of Judgment. And if you follow the janazah and you wait until it's been buried, then you have two qirat, two mountains. There's a very interesting story here that, I, that I'll share with you all. Ibn Umar radiallahu anhu was once sitting in the masjid and a man came to him and said, Ya Aba Abdullah, Zakallah khair shaykh. Ya Aba Abdullah, he said, Oh, 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 uh, or actually he said, Ya Abdullah. He said to Ibn Umar, Oh, Abdullah. He said, Do you hear what Abu Huraira is telling the people? Abdullah bin Umar said, What's Abu Huraira telling the people? He said, he's saying that the Prophet ﷺ said, and he mentioned the hadith, that if you pray janazah on someone, you get a qirat, you get a mountain of uhud of good deeds. And if you follow it, then you get two mountains. Now Ibn Umar anhu, he didn't know about the following the janazah part, being another qirat, another mountain of good deeds. So Ibn Umar anhu knew about the reward of praying salat al-janazah being a qirat, being one mountain of good deed. He didn't know about the second one. So Ibn Umar radiallahu anhu, he quickly sent a messenger to Aisha radiallahu anha. He said, go ask Aisha radiallahu anha if she's heard this as well. If she's heard about this, this idea of following the janazah until it's buried, and then having a second mountain of good deeds. So the, the messenger of, of uh, Abdullah bin Umar radiallahu anhu, he went to Aisha radiallahu anha, and Aisha radiallahu anha says, Sadaqakum Abu Huraira. Abu Huraira has told you all the truth. The Prophet ﷺ did say, and she mentioned the hadith as well. So when the messenger came back to Ibn Umar ta'ala anhu and told him that Aisha radiallahu anha says that Abu Huraira was telling the truth, Abdullah bin Umar had some pebbles in his hands. He threw the pebbles, he got up, he put his hand on his head, and he was upset. And he says, Kam farratna fi qararita kathira. How many qararid, how many mountains of good deeds have we missed out on? Because he didn't know about the sunnah of following the janazah to the graveyard. So, kam farratna fi qararita kathira. How many mountains of good deeds have we missed out upon? And it's narrated that he never missed the burial of a janazah again. There are different hadith as well. The hadith of the Prophet ﷺ mentioning, uh, you know, sitting with the companions and saying, who amongst you has fasted today? And Abu Bakr raised his hand and another group of companions raised their hand. He said, who amongst you has given charity today? And Abu Bakr raised his hand and another group of companions raised their hand. Who amongst you has visited the sick today? Abu Bakr raised his hand and another group of companions raised their hands. Who amongst you followed a janazah today? Abu Bakr raised his hand and another group of companions raised their hand. And the Prophet ﷺ says that whoever combines these things in one day will enter Jannah in any way that they please, will enter paradise in any way that they please. Now, what if you're praying a janazah with multiple people? Let's say that there are, let's, you know, this isn't something common, but let's say there are five, six, seven people. Is the sunnah to pray separate janazahs or to pray one? one. But don't you want to get the qirat of each one? <laughs> right? So technically, let's say in Medina or Mecca, right? Especially when there's a janazah after every salat, and there are multiple, salatu ala al-amwat, salatu ala tiflain, and so on and so forth. What does it mean for you? Okay, a tiflain or the or the amwat, the babies and the amwat and, and the dead and nisa, the women and so on and so forth. What does that mean? Do you get the ajr of one salah when you pray on them all? No. If you prayed one salat al janaza on ten people, that's ten qirat. That's actually ten mountains of good deeds. Okay, so the sal- it's not the salah part that's being mentioned in the hadith, that's being referenced in the hadith, but as the Qadi Ayyad says, it's the person that's being prayed upon. So if you prayed and there were ten people, that's ten qirat, ten mountains. All right? And if you followed the janazas of those ten people, that's another ten mountains. That's twenty mountains of uhud in good deeds. So it's the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, that we have uh, from Allah. Finally, just as a last note, because um, mashallah, we have a lot of sisters here, and a lot of sisters are like, well, this doesn't apply to us, this isn't fair, this is only for men. 
what is the position of women going to the graveyard? It is a very, it is an ikhtilaf, it's a difference of opinion. Uh, the difference of opinion arises from the Prophet ﷺ cursing الزائرات, the women who frequent the graveyards, and na'ihat, the women who would slap their cheeks and would scream at the graveyard and cry loudly and so on and so forth. Now, niyaha, which is wailing at the graves, is forbidden for men and women. So to scream, to make noises, to, to take part in mourning customs. Okay, I know a lot of you aren't going to like to hear this, but the Prophet ﷺ mentions, or, or the Sahaba mentioned, a ta'am, eating upon the dead, or eating uh, uh, on, uh, you know, on behalf of, uh, uh, the, the hadith is from Jarir ibn Abdullah, al-ijtima' ila ahli al-mayyit, to gather with the, with the relatives of the deceased, and a ta'am, and to eat. Kunna na'uduha min al He says that we considered it to be a form of niyaha, it was from the wailing that hurts the dead. The Prophet ﷺ mentioned not to mourn and so on and so forth. Most of the customs, I, and I, I know this is deeply offensive, and you'll say, but we've been doing this for so many years, and you know, this is how it works in this country and that country, and I don't care if it's from Saudi Arabia, and this is the custom at the dead, almost all of them, without exception, are innovations, and in fact run contrary to the sunnah. The sunnah is that the f relatives of the family gather with each, they, 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 they gather alone, they're to be left alone. In fact, the Prophet ﷺ mentioned in the hadith of Ja'far, when Ja'far anhu passed away, to prepare food for them, to give them the food, because the women don't have time to cook right now, let them, let them not have to worry about responsibilities. Now we do the opposite, we make the families, we burden the families with having to worry about this huge group of people coming to their house. It's literally the opposite of the sunnah, okay? So the sunnah is that the family members are left alone, their matters are taken care of for them, so you take care of their stuff for them, you ease the burden. They don't want to see anybody right now, and it's deeply offensive when people come and sit in their house and start talking about irrelevant stuff. Right? You go and you sit and, you know, Astaghfirullah, Nallah, wa nazi raji'oon, inshallah to Jannah, then, you know, how about them cowboys? It's like, wait, what, what just happened here? Right? People immediately, almost immediately drift into their other conversations. That, how, how is that in accordance with the sunnah? Allahu alam has nothing to do with the sunnah. Right? So, niyaha was forbidden for men and women. This concept of mourning or long eulogies or customs when a person passes away, it's, it's forbidden for men and women. Okay? A certain type of coffee, like you drink a certain type of coffee, you eat a certain type of food. Trust me, gathering and eating biryani or eating steak is not going to benefit the dead. You want to give sadaqah? Give sadaqah to some poor people. It's not going to benefit the dead. All the customs were ruled out. So the Prophet ﷺ particularly hated the custom of people coming to the graveyard and screaming and so on and so forth and shouting out, Wa Sayyida, and so, you know, you know chatting, chatting all these great things about the person after they passed away. Now this was particular to the, the, the women of that time, the women of Jahliya, they had this, this, uh, this custom of niyaha which is that they would go to the graveyard and they would hit themselves and they would scream out poetry. And in fact, even in some Arab Christian cultures today, they still have na'ihaks. There's still a profession, there, there's still a group of women that follow the janaz, that follow the funerals, and they do niyaha, even in some Muslim cultures as well. Okay, so that was hated by the Prophet Sallallahu The Prophet Sallallahu cursed the women who do that because that was a predominant practice of the women. But now here's the thing. Aisha radiallahu anha and a large group of the ulama believe that there is absolutely nothing wrong with women going to the graveyard. And in fact, the dua of the graveyard, the dua of what to say in the graveyard of its most authentic narrations is when Aisha asked the Prophet sallallahu when I go to the graveyard, what should I say? Now if it was haram, the Prophet sallallahu would have said, why are you going to the graveyard? But he taught her the dua, okay? And so this is a, a, a dispute. Why? Because Aisha radiallahu anha, when her brother Abdul Rahman ibn Abi Bakr, he died a few miles away from Mecca. Aisha radiallahu anha made her way over uh, when he passed away. And when she got to Mecca, she said, where is the grave of my brother? Where is the grave of my brother? So they pointed her towards the grave and she went to his grave a month later and she prayed janazah on him. And Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha, she used to visit his grave. Now some of the Sahaba, uh, they said to her, Abdul Rahman ibn, uh, ibn Abi Mulaika, he came to her and he said, didn't the Prophet ﷺ forbid women from, from going to the graveyard? And Aisha responded and said, that was when the Prophet ﷺ forbade men and women from visiting the graveyard. 
So when the Prophet ﷺ lifted the prohibition of visiting the graveyard, he lifted it for the men and the women, but the prohibition on niyaha remains. The prohibition on za'irat, na'ihat, on women screaming and so on and so forth, that remains. So according to Aisha radiallahu anha, and she is the most authoritative figure on these masail, on these issues, especially when it comes to women, no one's going to understand like she does. When it comes to the Prophet ﷺ and the fiqh of women, she is the one who teaches the fiqh of women and almost everything else. So Aisha did not understand the Prophet ﷺ to have prohibited women from praying janazah and from going to the graveyard. It is a difference of opinion to some of the madhahib. Um, you know, uh, they do hold that it's prohibited. Um, some of the schools do not hold that it's prohibited. Um, and Imam Ahmad rahimahullah ta'ala was a strong proponent of, of this idea that women could pray the janazas and they could even go to the graveyards so long as they don't frequent them and they don't carry out these customs uh, that were known to the Arabs before. So, Allahu alam, that's just an opinion to put forward, uh, which I believe, and there, there are other evidences as well. Uh, one of them, the woman who, um, the Prophet ﷺ saw her in the graveyard and she was crying, and the Prophet ﷺ told her to be patient and she responded with, uh, you know, what do you know of my situation? She basically lashed out at the Prophet ﷺ. And the Prophet ﷺ left her and then the Sahaba told her that you lashed out at the Prophet ﷺ. So when they told her that, she was so apologetic. She went to the Prophet ﷺ, she sought forgiveness and so on and so forth. And the Prophet ﷺ told her that as-sabr and the sadmat al-ula, that true patience is at the first strike. Again, no censorship, no condemning her for being there and so on and so forth, but instead the idea of showing patience when the tragedy strikes you. So Allah knows best, but it seems that, you know, again, it's a, it's a difference of opinion there. Uh, but there is a strong, you know, uh, there, there is strong evidence that it's okay for women to go to the graveyards as well, to pray janaz and go to the graveyard, so long as they abstain from objectionable things. So it is something that's good for us to do, inshallah ta'ala, to follow the janazah. Let's try to think like Ibn Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu a little bit. You know, when, when we hear of a janazah taking place in a city, we should make an attempt to go and pray that janazah. And if we have the time, we should actually make the attempt to follow that janazah, inshaAllah ta'ala. Um, Wallahu ta'ala alam, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to have mercy upon our dead, to allow us to have husn al-khitam, to allow us to have good endings, and to allow us to be amongst those that are greeted by the angels of mercy and not by the angels of wrath and punishment. Allahumma ameen. Questions? Yeah. Attending the funerals of non-Muslims is, is, is also a difference of opinion. Uh, the strongest stance, that, or the stance that I hold, Allah alam, is that it's okay to go. It's just not okay to participate in the rituals. Uh, why? Because the Prophet Sallallahu the very famous hadith, that uh, uh, the janazah of a Jewish man passed by the Prophet Sallallahu and the Prophet Sallallahu stood up when the janazah of that Jew passed by, and they said, Ya Rasulullah, it's not even a Muslim, it's a Jew. The Prophet ﷺ says, is it not a human being? SubhanAllah. You talk about respect, it's, it's beautiful, right? So that idea of showing respect, showing respect to the dead who are not Muslims is fine. Just you can't participate in the ibad and the rituals and so on and so forth. Um, so Allahu Alam, it seems that there is absolutely nothing wrong with it, inshallah, but a person should avoid the rituals. Yeah. What's that? Can the dead hear? Um, if Allah wants them to hear. Uh, to be honest, there you know, there is really no there is no there isn't a blanket statement that indicates that the dead can hear. But can Allah make the dead hear in certain situations? Yes, he can. Like when the Prophet Sallallahu um, after the Battle of Badr, when Abu Jahl was killed and, and Uqba was killed and some of the greatest enemies, the oppressors of the Muslims were killed, the Prophet Sallallahu spoke to them. And he says that we have found what Allah has promised us to be true. Have you found what Allah has promised you to be true? And they said, Ya Rasulullah, can they hear? And the Prophet Sallallahu said, they can hear just as you can hear. I mean, they hear very clearly. At that point, Allah made them to hear. So the general rule is no. The general rule is no. But if Allah wants to make them hear, they can hear. Okay? The general rule is that no, we assume that the dead can't hear. All right, there are a lot of questions here. I'm going to go sister, brother, sister, so I'll go brother now, and then we'll come back and talk. So 
The issue is following the janazah and visiting the graveyard. So, so there's a variance of opinions there. Some of the scholars said, well, if the woman is in the masjid and a janazah takes place, then she can pray janazah, but she shouldn't go with the intention of praying janazah. Some of them said she can go with the intention of praying janazah, but not follow the salah to the graveyard and so on and so forth. And the correct, I, I don't even want to say the correct opinion, okay? I'm going to say the opinion that I hold and the opinion of, of the majority of the scholars is that it's fine for her to go pray the janazah and follow the janazah to the graveyard as well, so long as she abstains from those practices. Yeah. The, the, the recommended act when you go to the graveyard is to simply read the dua of entering into the graveyard, which has come in different variations. As-salamu alaykum ahl diyar peace be on to you, dwellers of the graves. Uh, the Prophet وسلم, would say, Antum sabi, uh, min al-mu'minina wal-muslimin, or min al-mu'minina wal-mu'minat, so from the believing men, the believing women. Um, Antum sabiqun wa inna insha'Allah bikum lahiqun. You are the ones who have preceded us and we are soon to follow. Nas'alullah lana wa lakum al-afiyah. We ask Allah that both you and us are forgiven and are granted pardon. Uh, there are various authentic ways to recite the du'a of entering into the graveyard, inshaAllah. Um, so just that's that's it. And being, you know, not not sitting on the graves, not not doing anything strange. Just just making du'a for the person, making du'a for the deceased, um, and reflecting. It's a very silent, um, it's a very silent ritual, if you will. Right, that a person reflects and they do tadabbur and tafakkur and they make du'a for the deceased. And by the way, your du'a in your house is the same as your du'a when you're next to their grave. But there is no doubt that obviously if you're sitting there looking at that person's grave, that your du'a would probably be more sincere. But from a technical perspective, du'a in the house is the same as du'a if you were, if a person was to visit the grave. Wait, well, okay. Yeah. Okay, so eulogies. Uh, what's haram with eulogies is, is like an, an organized speech and so on and so forth and, and extolling the person and mentioning, you know, lavishing praise on them. Because look, when everyone passes away, you know, and, and if you just watch the news every night and you watch the family of the deceased, when everyone passes away and they start talking about that person, oh, he was the best friend I ever had, most loyal person, most kind person. Everyone has the same description, right? And that's why when the Prophet ﷺ, when he heard the companions speaking ill of somebody when they passed away, the Prophet ﷺ says, Wajabat lahunar, hellfire became mandatory for him. Because if you're so bad that people can't find anything nice to say about you, even when you die, you must have really been a zalim. Like you must have seriously been an oppressor and a transgressor, right? But on the other hand, the Prophet ﷺ mentioned when the, when, when the Sahaba spoke well of a person, the Prophet ﷺ says that Wajabat lahul jannah, that paradise became mandatory for him by virtue of of the good things that you said about him. Antum shuhada Allah fil ard. You are the witnesses of Allah on this earth. Allah makes the ultimate judgment, but you are the witnesses of Allah on this earth. So when a person passes away, certainly we should speak well of them and we should make dua for them and so on and so forth, but not organized rituals. Um, so for example, one of the the famous eulogies, which was just a natural speech, a nat natural words of praise, was when Abu Bakr passed away, the eulogy of Ali radiallahu anhu for Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu. It's beautiful. So there's a concept of speaking well and mentioning and so on and so forth. But just not these long, drown-out speeches that are formal, that are rituals and so on and so forth. Mourning gatherings, right? Not mourning with you, but or not or not mourning without the you, but mourning with the you, right? Like actual mourning gatherings and so on and so forth. Rituals where people come and offer speeches. That's what's prohibited. And that's where the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi mentioned uh, that when a person is buried and the people start to chant out all these these things, the angels poke that person and say, Ahakada kunt? Were you what they say about you? You know, are you really what they say about you? Because people go overboard, right? So that's what it is. Speaking well of people is necessary. Speaking ill is haram. So the second question is, would visuals be fall within Vigils for the dead. Yes. Would it fall within, under, or um, prohibited? Uh, rich? It depends what the purpose of that vigil is. If the purpose of that vigil is simply to mark the death, 
then there's a problem. Vigils as a form of protest, I personally don't see a problem with it. Vigils as a form of protest, as a form of demonstration, I don't see a problem with it at all. <laughs> because it's not being done as a ibadah, it's not being done as a form of demonstration, with this, which is permissible with its principles, being, with, with, with things, certain things being observed and certain things being avoided, right? But vigils for this, like, can, can I light candles every year to mark the death of a person? That wouldn't be allowed because that's a ritual at that point. We're not going to end with these questions. So who had their, uh, yeah. Um, Just tell them you love them. Try to make them feel better. Don't don't ever like 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 when people are when people have lost someone and they're well even the prophet saw someone that woman lashed out at him at the graveyard. He didn't sit there and lecture and say, "Woman, taqillah, I'm the prophet of Allah." He left her. At that point, no, you know you're not in the, you're not in the right state of mind, the right frame of mind, which is why you need to prepare yourself before that moment on how to carry yourself. So just at that point, be quiet, hear them all, tell them you love them. Inshallah. And try to make them feel better. All right, I'm going to take two more questions from the men, two more questions from the women. Okay, so I'm going to go back here. Yes. Oh, yeah. Yes. That's Allah, that's hal. That's just the, the blessing of Allah. If you showed up at the masjid and there happened to be a janazah and you stayed and you prayed the janazah, do you still get the qirat? That's fine. You still get one qirat. Uh huh. Okay. You still do it for uh, non-Muslim No. Tashmit al-Atus, which is to say, Irhamuk Allah, is when a Muslim says, Alhamdulillah, when they sneeze. Bless you. bless you is not Irhamuk Allah. <laughs> Saying bless you is, if you mean yani, Hidayah, may Allah guide you, that's fine. You can wish yeah. prosperity. For, for Muslims who don't speak Arabic, you say, bless you or Irhamuk You say, Irhamuk Allah. If, if they don't know what you, if they just hopefully they don't think you curse them out. I mean, I've never said Alhamdulillah. If the Muslim knew enough to say Alhamdulillah when he sneezed, then most likely he's going to know somewhat what Alhamdulillah is, right? So, inshallah, if someone gets mad at you for saying Alhamdulillah, just let me know. <laughs> Sit him down and explain it to him, inshallah. <laughs> All right. Yes. Y- you, yeah. During the janazah, the soul is aware of the surroundings. Yes. The Prophet says, Yatbir al mayyit thalaf, that the, the dead person is followed by three things. Yarujir ithnan wa yafqa wahid, two things go leave him and, and one thing stays with him. Yatbiru al mal wal ahl, what follows him are his, is his wealth, his family, and his actions. The wealth and the family leave him, and the only thing that stays with him is his deeds, his amal. So you're aware of it, and that's what you're followed with, but at the end of the day, you're left alone with your deeds. Last question from him. Al-Quran wal hadith Naam, an Fir'aun. An Fir'aun, al-aya an al-barzakh an Fir'aun. There is the aya in... Um, نَارُ يُعْرَضُونَ عَلَيْهَا بُكْرَةً وَعَشِيهَا And then, أَدْخِلْ إيش الآية يا شيخ؟ نَارُ يُعْرَضُونَ عَلَيْهَا غُدُوًا وَعَشِيهَا أَدْخِلُ آلَ فِرْعَوْنَ النَّارُ نعم القرآن السنة تفسر القرآن Sunnah to Fasul Quran, a hadith sahih to Fasul Quran. So when you have ayat that are ambiguous and that mention things, then you go to the Sunnah to explain them. Just like a salah. A salawat al khams, the five prayers. There are no ulama, they say there's no adab al qabr. I personally, so if you, no, I'm answering you in English just because of the people. None of the none of the scholars none of the scholars of the past none of the scholars of the traditional sciences none of the imams and so on and so forth denied adab al qabr it's a contemporary thing and only different groups and so on and so forth. Allah alam. All right, last sister, and then that's it. Yes, one of you. You guys have to flip a coin. <laughs> Mother, daughter, mother, daughter. Mother, daughter. Okay. Bismillah. Those people, the dead is not available for the first time. So what happens to the soul? 
Allah will deal with them in a, in a unique way. So people have exceptions, Allah will deal with them in a unique way, which is why the Prophet ﷺ mentioned to us the man who told his children to cremate him so that Allah cannot punish me because he was afraid of the punishment of Allah, so he told his kids to cremate him, to burn his body to ashes. Then the Prophet ﷺ said, Allah gathered him and said to him, why did you do that? And he says, خَشَيْتُكَ يَا رَبُّ أَنْ تَعْلَمْ that, you were, that I was afraid of you, O Allah, O my Lord, and you know best. So, غَفَرَ اللَّهُ لَهُ بِذَارَكَ Allah forgave him because Allah saw the sincerity in it. But it doesn't, if a person had a death that's unique and so on and so forth, then they'll be dealt with in those unique circumstances. Wallah alam. Alright guys, we've gone way too late tonight. Zakam Allah khayran, subhanahu wa ta'ala, ashadu ala anastaghfiru wa ta'ala. There is a break from class next week. Next week I'll be out of town. So we will resume two weeks from today, inshaAllah ta'ala. Please keep that in mind. Barakallahu feekum, assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.